My name is Bruce Goodham. I'm the chair of the Western Washington Fellowship of Reconciliation. I want to welcome all of you here tonight. We're celebrating 100 years of a remarkable event that occurred in the midst of a very terrible war. And what the Fellowship of Reconciliation has to add to this is simply that we share that impulse that those soldiers had a hundred years ago to lay down their arms, lay down their weapons, quell their fears, and attempt peace in a time of high stress. And our story, that of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, began essentially at the same time with the same impulse. A hundred years of people of courage trying to make a difference and bring peace through nonviolent action, through nonviolent resolution of conflict, was the mission of the FOR. The quick version of the story you have in your program. Just as World War I, as war was declared, there was a conference of Christian clergy that was occurring in an effort to try to prevent that great and horrible war from happening. I mean, it was evident that war clouds were on the horizon. But war was declared while clergy were in that conference, and they had to depart. But at a railroad station, Henry Hodgkin, an English Quaker, Friedman Schultz, I believe, was the German ch uh, chaplain to the Kaiser from Germany. Here's Henry Hodgkin and Friedrich Sigmund Schultz with a handshake at the railroad station in Cologne said, even though our countries are at war, we are still one. We will continue to work for peace. From that humble beginning, the FOR is the prior slide that said it's now the oldest interfaith international organization devoted to nonviolent conflict resolution, but is really only one expression, one part of a multifaceted uh, experience. And so the slides that follow, there will be pieces of these that are FOR story, but they're really the story of the movement that all of us have. Uh, gained inspiration from, for peace and for justice and for nonviolent conflict resolution. One of the early uh, leaders of the Fellowship of Reconciliation back in, he actually joined back in 1916, which was one year after the FOR was born in the United States and two years after the International Fellowship of Reconciliation was started, which started first in Britain. A.J. Muskie. Congregational minister, then became a Quaker, and he was a labor organizer and many, many things. He also was the first person to introduce the concept of nonviolence to Martin Luther King when King was still a young man and was not persuasive enough to persuade King at the time, but intrigued him and raised that, planted that seed so that it sprouted later when King had additional exposure to nonviolence, particularly through the writings of who we studied vociferously. Jane Addams was another early uh, person in the FOR history. Uh, she joined, I believe, yes, in 1917, and was an early pioneer for women's suffrage, women's rights, and some of you may not know that she was actually the founder of the profession of social work. It did not exist until Jane Addams made that happen, and also a Nobel Peace Prize winner. The ACLU, now a huge organization, doing many, many good and brave things over the years. That started from FOR members and others, but its primary and original purpose was to protect conscientious objectors and war protesters in World War I from undue state repression of those protests, and then grew 
say that a democracy can only survive if the voices of those who are disdained can be heard. Because sometimes the minority viewpoint is the right viewpoint, as history has shown us. I mean, we could also believe the world is flat, but it might not serve us as well as Galileo's insight. As we move through into earlier, uh, more recent times, one of the early efforts for civil rights was in 1947, the FOR uh, actually helped to form the Congress of Racial Equality, and then CORE, Congress of Racial Equality and FOR, both joined together to do what was called the Journey of Reconciliation. And this was after there was a Supreme Court decision that had said that international travel, there really couldn't be segregation in international travel. But it was something that the southern states said explicitly, we're not going to follow that rule. We don't care. And so in 1947, some very brave souls, including Bayard Rustin, Miguel Rodenko, Jim Peck, and George Hauser, George Hauser and Bayard Rustin being on staff at the FOR at the time, uh, organized a bus ride through the upper south because the deep south they would fear they would not survive. The Upper South was harsh enough. They got beaten repeatedly. The buses were burned. Uh, this was an act of extreme courage, but it shone a beacon for efforts that came a decade later and two decades later. And George Hauser, who is the young white guy just to the left of the um, second from the right in the picture, is still alive and with us today in his 90s and regales with many, many amazing stories. One of his wonderful stories is of efforts with early uh, horror work while with FOR in Chicago in 1943. In an effort to desegregate restaurants, uh, there was a restaurant called Stoner's, and it said explicitly, we are not going to serve blacks in this restaurant. Uh, it would be bad for business. And so a mixed company of black and white went to the restaurant and nonviolently said, we would like to be seated. And the restaurant owner said, I'm sorry, we are not going to seat you because you are integrated uh, and we don't serve people like you. But you can stand here. Uh, we just won't serve you. We're not going to seat you. And so they stood. And they stood. And they stood some more. And finally, there were a couple of boys from the group who went and took a table and then invited a black from the group to join them at the table. Now, this was a fairly critical point because what was the restaurant now going to do? They had seated the whites who they said they would, but now they didn't have an invitation. And all of a sudden, from the restaurant, not somebody with them, elderly white woman invited to her table some of the other black members of the protest. And one by one, other tables in the restaurant invited and brought in the remaining black members of the group until they were all seated, at which point the entire restaurant rose in applause. Stoners was integrated. Here we have a picture of Bayard Rustin, uh, a gay, pacifist black man standing up for what he believed at a time in history when his word and his vision and who he was was way early for what people could accept, but with bravery he maintained and persisted. George Hauser being the one that can next to him. Acts like that were inspired by and also inspired Gandhi, who was doing much the same from South Africa in the 1920s and then in India in the 1930s and the 1940s. And of course, the famous story that we have of Rosa 
Uh, Rosa was not a member of the fellowship, but I'm just, these are the examples uh, of the last hundred years, just snippets. Uh, she didn't know what she was going to start, and that's what she says there. For her, it was just another day. It was just another act of doing the right thing. As one of my friends says, just do the next right thing. One step at a time. However, the Fellowship of Reconciliation was deeply involved with the Civil Rights Movement and with King. As I said, King first was introduced to nonviolence uh, by A.J. Muskie. And the FOR published this comic book about the Montgomery story, which became so prolific and so widespread, it inspired people all over the world, including um, translations in a variety of different countries, inspiring other activists to engage in nonviolent action in other countries. And one of the uh, folks that had been with King, who is now a congressman from Georgia, Congressman John Lewis, recently wrote a book modeled after that comic book, and it's a comic book called March. And uh, the book itself is referred to as the comic book that changed the world because it was so widespread and so profound. And who would have thought that a comic book would have such an impact? But here indeed, uh, the seeds that we sow, we don't know until much later that maybe they will bear the fruit. James Lawson, a former chair of the FOR, also a lieutenant, someone who was on the FOR staff and who went and helped King, and King called him the chief or the leading theorist for nonviolence uh, at the time. Uh, he's still alive and still working and training young people, uh, including my daughter from last year. And here, of course, is someone that we know that has probably inspired more of us to contemplate power of nonviolence than any other in uh, U.S. history. This is Martin Luther King's Fellowship of Reconciliation membership card, something that the FOR saw as a great power. And of course, King was one of those instrumental people that showed us that issues don't come singly, they are interconnected, and that he identified the three primary evils of racism and militarism and poverty. As he was speaking out about his opposition to the war, it was then that he was uh, cut down early uh, in that opposition. Of course, all of us know the story of King and I have the main speech. But you don't get there unless you start with the smaller steps, and that's some of what we're seeing here. The smaller steps include saying that we do And they come all the way up to the present. On the far right is David Hartso, who just wrote a book on the Raging Peace, just talking about his life and all the efforts that he's made, all the actions that he's taken. Um, he was an FOR National Council member, uh, started a group called the Nonviolent Peace Force, which is now going out and all over the world intervening nonviolently in uh, deadly conflicts and to do uh, accompanying work. On the left is Reverend Seiko who is a representative from FOR, who is now working in Ferguson uh, with the conflict that's going there. And just a matter of a couple of weeks ago, I uh, had, uh, there was a, a group, an integrated group on the street. Uh, Reverend Seiko took the stand right across the street, a whole phalanx of police officers, and Reverend Seiko started the crowd. with the heartbeat of democracy. And he called out to the police across the street, and he implored that they and their captain would stand down, that there was no violence here, there was no need for them to confront, that the group that was gathered was there in the spirit of King of Gandhi. And indeed, the police left moments later. The driver's sake to again, And here, just very quickly, we'll run through this. You folks know these people. Nelson Mandela, who thought that violence was the 
frustrated with that and turned to a more nonviolent approach later, which he then found actually ended up being effective within the Jakarta. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi from Burma, uh, Myanmar, who had been under house arrest uh, for her beliefs in nonviolence and her opposition to the regime in Burma. Uh, this is a lesser known, but uh, I believe an Afghani young lady who is speaking out um, for women and education in a country where there's a lot of beliefs that those two things don't go together and has had many, many death threats. Now, now here's a guy that I don't think is 17 anymore. Uh, this is Albert Einstein, and many of us know him famous for his physics, but he also was a, a pacifist and regretted his own role in the uh, development of the atomic bomb, uh, but gave us a lot of wise words to follow. Uh, Desmond Tutu from South Africa, of course, some scenes from uh, King, and this was the uh, first draft card burning in 1963, an act that seemed just heinous at the time, but then led to uh, inspiring people to print more. This is Thich Nhat Hanh from Vietnam, a Vietnamese Buddhist, who also was promoting nonviolence in a, a theater of the North. Uh, obviously, a scene from the 60s with the flower power movement and the opposition. The Dalai Lama currently alive and still kicking with messages of peace and nonviolence. Even while Tibet remains under Chinese uh, dominion. Maya Angelou, uh, obviously uh, her loss recently is regretted, but she's marching over the glorious diamond in 1983. And again, it's just you know people doing things, and uh, you know, these are the folks that things that we know, but it takes each and every one of us, little bits, little steps. Um, I'm going to flip through the rest of the slides. I think everybody will probably recognize, but I just want to tell one more story. This is the story of rice bags. It's an example of what we don't know and how powerful we can be. In the 1950s, Eisenhower was president, I think it was 1953, there was a famine going on in China, and he was getting a lot of pressure from the Pentagon at the time that they, 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 they wanted to use nuclear weapons on China. China was, you know, communists and they were terrible, and the Pentagon and the Joint Chiefs of Staff were very right wing. Eisenhower asked, How many of those little bags have we got? And what was he referring to? Little bags of rice that had been sent by the FOR and by other organizations, but FOR came up with the idea to send little rice bags to Eisenhower to urge him to send relief to China for the family. Well, how does that deal with dropping a nuclear bomb? Eisenhower saw the connection. He was told there's over 40 to 50,000 of these rice bags that have come in so far. When he heard that, he told the chiefs of staff, the people that were telling him, you need to use nuclear weapons on China. If there are 40 or 50,000 Americans who are wanting us to feed the Chinese, the last thing in the world we should do is bomb them. Thank you to 40 or 50,000 people who took the time to send in a little rice bag. And we didn't know it for decades afterwards. But that, in all likelihood, prevented a nuclear Keep up the spirit, imbibe the vibes that you get here tonight, and keep putting one foot in front of the other, for we are all a fellowship in the effort to create peace, in the effort to create justice from which peace must flow. Enjoy yourselves tonight. We shall open